I'd like to continue a series that I started a while back on uh, the history of philosophy from a Christian standpoint. Um, philosophy is the, uh, the study or the reflection on the ability of human beings to answer really profound questions that we have as human beings. Uh, for example, most of us can relate to the experience of asking, you know, why? Why, why am I here? Where, where did I come from? Where am I going? What does life mean? What's good for us to do as human beings? What's a good life? Uh, what is reality? What's it made of? Uh, how can I know it? How can I know the world? Or, or what allows me to be able to know reality? Uh, what assumptions are justifiable? Um, why, do, why do I trust human logic? Or should I trust human logic? All of these are areas that fit into uh, the range or the realm of philosophy. There are technical words, of course, for each of these different categories. Uh, like epistemology, for example, is the word that's used to, to describe the study of human knowledge. Logic, of course, is a study of the very structures of human knowledge, uh, analyzing how we think and, and what is valid reasoning and what are pitfalls or dangers or uh, invalid forms of human reason. Uh, the study of ethics or morality is a study of what is good for us as human beings, so far as human actions are concerned. So philosophy considers all these different areas of human knowledge and of, uh, of human reflection on the really great and big questions of human life. And there have been some outstanding people in our tradition, uh, and when I say that our tradition, I'm speaking of the Western philosophical tradition in contrast to the Far Eastern philosophical tradition, uh, which has primarily found its way into f different forms of religious expression or, uh, or um, ethical systems. Uh, like Hinduism or Buddhism and uh, Confucianism and so on. These different Eastern religions embody their approach to the moral life and to reality. Some very interesting things there, of course, uh, and there are certainly many points of contact and much similarity between these two traditions. But we're talking about the Western tradition uh, that Christianity is a part of, uh, at least initially. It grows up within the Western world, within the Roman world, and that Roman world had a tradition, a philosophical tradition, that preceded the birth of Christianity. It also had, of course, the tradition of the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition. And Christianity, in many ways, comes to exist within a dialogue and interaction between these different forces and these different uh, ways of thinking. Christianity, of course, a big part of the story of Christianity, is its ability to assimilate within itself the insights of human reason. And this, of course, raises all kinds of interesting questions about what is the relationship between human knowledge uh, and also the truths or the claims of Christian faith. Uh, so uh, we are called to believe, as Christians, we're called to believe certain things, uh, but how does that relate to the discoveries of science uh, or to the insights of philosophers? So my purpose in these various presentations here, kind of walking through the history of philosophy, at least picking up some of the important names and persons in this history, my goal is to just sort of highlight some of the ideas of these great minds and persons, uh, to bring them to your awareness and to mull over a little bit or to reflect a little bit on their ideas in relationship to Christian faith. So in uh, the prior four presentations that I gave, we kind of worked our way up to Socrates, and I want to say a few things about uh, Socrates as a way of preparing the way for Plato. And, uh, and then we'll reflect a little bit on Plato in a, in a future presentation. But let me just say a couple things about Socrates. Uh, first of all, we only know of Socrates through, primarily through the writings of Plato. That's where we know the, the, the vast amount that we know about Socrates. And, of course, it's difficult to draw the line between Plato and Socrates because Plato, all of his writings are in the form of a dialogue. Uh, that means that you have multiple conversation partners that are in the text. Always, in Plato's writings, Socrates is the hero of the dialogue. He's the real philosopher. He's the person seeking after the truth. But he does so through a method of dialogue. And this isn't just a literary uh, device of Plato, of using dialogue. It's also, I think, a, uh, a statement about his approach to philosophy. Plato and Socrates believe that the best way to discover truth, or the primary path, uh, to philosophical discovery is the path of dialogue. If a person is just closed up in their own mind and they have nothing outside of their own mind to stimulate their thought, uh, then we are all the more impoverished. I benefit from other people challenging my mind 
I benefit from other people who question assumptions that I have. Oftentimes we, we assume certain things and until another person points out uh, perhaps an invalid assumption or perhaps an, an unclarified or unexamined assumption or presupposition, we don't really understand even our own position. So it's by engaging another person in dialogue or conversation and having our views put under a spotlight that we're able to more clearly understand them and see them. And for Socrates and Plato, this is all also the path toward enlightenment ourselves. Uh, the path to enlightenment for us is typically through engaging other minds, even clashing with other minds, and then out of that clash and out of that genuine pursuit for discovery comes insight. Examine your own experience and see if that isn't true. The, the most wonderful teachers that I've had in the course of my life, in, in college and in graduate school especially, but also in, uh, in uh, lower levels of school, the greatest teachers that I've had are those that challenged me to think and to reflect on what I was learning. By questioning me and by getting me to think about it and, and develop a, a genuine understanding of the material by questioning me and by causing me to think carefully about what I was studying, that material would get more deeply inside of me than if I were simply given a list of things to memorize without examining them or encountering them on a deeper level. So Socrates uh, was very much, according to the, the dialogues of Plato, Socrates was the kind of guy who would go around and question smart people, people he thought he could learn from. He would find them and question them, first of all based on the assumption that there's much that I don't know. And this is another important point about Socrates, is that you begin with a premise, you begin with the assumption that there's much that I don't know. In fact, I could even begin with the premise, at least as, as Socrates would present it, I can begin with the premise that I don't know anything yet as I ought to know. And if I don't know as I ought to know, now I'm ready to examine everything that I hold and try to come up with the strongest understanding and the strongest position that I possibly can. So Socrates is a man that deeply wants to learn, and he wants to admit his own ignorance. At least in my own personal experience as well, the, the, uh, the pr people that I've known who were wisest, who had a, deepest, a deeper knowledge of themselves than is common to us as, as human beings, the people with the deepest knowledge of themselves, the deepest knowledge of, of reality, in my experience have been people that were genuinely humble about learning. Uh, they admitted that there was so much that they didn't know and that a lifetime is not long enough to explore everything that is worthy of exploration. And that's how Socrates was. He went about questioning people, trying to learn, and to try to benefit from their challenging of his own claims and his own insights. Socrates, according to all that we know, was very concerned about a particular philosophical movement called Sophism, or the Sophists, or Sophists. The word sophism or sophist comes from the Greek word sophia, which means wisdom. But in this case, it means a kind of pseudo-wisdom. The sophists were people who were known for their ability to manipulate information in order to persuade crowds. They were people that might be in demand for uh, helping politicians, let's say, or perhaps being politicians themselves. Because as a politician, one would want to have the skill of, of rhetoric, of being able to persuade a public to communicate well. And if I can communicate well, perhaps I can win people over to my position. Well, the sophists uh, came to be known as a people, at least as we discover them in Plato and Socrates. The sophists became known as people who really didn't care about the ultimate truth of things. They were interested in persuading public opinion. They were interested in uh, skills of communication that would allow them to be successful in the world, but they weren't so much concerned about truth or what is the truth about reality or what can we know for sure about the world. One famous uh, sophist, Protagoras, said uh, famously, man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. In other words, the human person is the ruler that judges all things rather than reality or something beyond ourselves. Uh, being the judge or the ultimate determination of what is truth. The human person decides that. So what's good in our community or in our time may not necessarily be what's good in another community at another time. In other words, there's no objective morality, there's no objective truth about the world. Socrates was very um, much opposed to this uh, aspect of Sophism. Uh, he was opposed to it because he believed that the human mind was a fantastic power for discovering truth, 
And therefore, to use the human mind to deceive others or to distort others or just to manipulate other people so that you can use them for your own benefit by making money or having political power or whatever. For Socrates, this was an, an abuse, a distortion of the human mind and of its, uh, its uh, wonderful power for, for determining the truth. Finally, I'd like to say something about the death of Socrates. Uh, Socrates uh, lived his life fighting for uh, opposing sophism and trying to push toward a, an objective discovery of truth about the world. He developed a method of dialogue whereby he questioned others relentlessly in an effort to try to discover uh, truth um, and, uh, and insight and to discover uh, things that were insightful. And then finally, uh, I want to say a couple words about his death. He had lived his life fighting for the truth uh, and the discovery of truth and the defense of truth. But in the process of doing so, he had called in question uh, some of the assumptions of the people of Athens. And this brought upon him the anger of the authorities. And at the end of the story of Socrates, we find him condemned to death. And you can read about the charges against him in the famous uh, book by uh, Plato called The Apology, uh, and it has uh, a, a kind of remembrance of sorts, I'm sure embellished or, or uh, uh, you know, reworded in many ways, but, but you can get a sense of, at least in Plato's mind, the events of the, uh, the um, uh, determination that Socrates was guilty of a very profound crime. And the crime of which he was guilty was that he was subverting the youths of Athens, the young people. He was uh, directing them in the wrong way. And this was because he was calling in question uh, the gods of the Athenians, of the Greeks, and of others of their beliefs. Now that's not to say that Socrates was an atheist or Socrates was opposed to religious belief. To the contrary, as we discover uh, through Plato and Plato's own experience, Plato appears to have been a deeply religious man in the sense that he sees in reality far more than just the material. In fact, for, uh, for uh, Plato and Socrates, I think it's fair to say that they are almost the opposite extreme of materialism, uh, that the only, the only thing that exists is the, is the sensory world. Plato and Socrates seem to st uh, stand really on the opposite side of things, that what's really real is the spiritual, the mental, uh, the immaterial. That's what's really real. Uh, the sensory world is just an illusory, uh, sort of shadowy world, uh, and that it is ours, at least if we are good philosophers, to look beyond the sensory and the changing world and to see the spiritual or the immaterial. So uh, Socrates and Plato are not calling in question God in principle, but they are calling in question some of the assumptions of the Athenians about the gods and about their nature. Uh, so, uh, Socrates, though, is condemned to death, and in fact he does die, even though he had the opportunity to escape death. Uh, he chooses to, uh, to go ahead and allow himself to be executed, uh, because for him it was a matter of justice, that he did not see any reason to excuse himself from the legal system of Athens, even if they had made a mistake in his own case, because he had benefited from the Athenian system of government his whole life. And so he follows through, uh, or he doesn't try to escape from his execution, and he is in fact executed. Uh, but apparently the impact of his life never left the thoughts of one of his students, Plato. And Plato will spend the rest of his uh, life writing uh, books in which he offers uh, explanations of uh, his master Socrates' approach to the discovery of truth, and also I'm sure his own insights and discoveries. Uh, but Socrates, uh, rightfully, is a, a man uh, greatly respected for his methodology, the so-called Socratic method, his opposition to relativism and his defense of the power of human reason to discover the truth, and also his consistency in standing for and defending his principles, even though they meant his own death.